we were all putting on parties. We created a SAS called Mellow Magic to my friends who lived on the road. And um, we started to put on our own events from a very young age, you know, 15 years old. Problem, I turned up and um, at the event in Bethlehem Green, you know, not knowing what to expect. It was a madness, you know. It was, it was empty one minute, the next minute it was absolutely mocked with people, and everyone was shouting, I see it, and pouring with sweat and no shirts, and it was like completely insane. So when we went New Year's Eve now, it was amazing, you know, we tapped out 6,000 people, and it was like, it was like, wow, this is, they'd never been as party that size ever before. We had Mini Benelli, they'd come down, they had lots of celebrities, Boy George was there, everyone just came down and mixed. It was a mix of everybody. Um, I knew people who were at the heart of manufacture, and you know, it made complete sense at that time. I knew everyone who was supplying drugs at the party. When I was in Jamaica, to the wharf, to the docks, the airports, we had it, you know. And we basically used to ship a shitload of, you know, cannabis back to this country. It's untouchable because you're safe from police, authorities, you know, pretty covered in every angle possible. Um, and you're having a great bloody life and you're living in the sunshine, happy days. I got a phone call and said, what's happened? I said, Black Black has been murdered. Well, it's scary, it became an everyday occurrence. Then, what they say, bad luck is worse than obia. Old Jamaican saying, sometimes you just are so close, yet so far. Current TV will bring you the most exciting interviews from around the world. Today, delighted to be with former criminal kingpin and cocaine kingpin mastermind Andrew Pritchard. Um, Andrew's now concentrating on much more positive things, um, specifically offender rehabilitation with the AP Foundation, uh, which is a designated charity. So he's really gone the full circle. Um, and there's no one better to sort of concentrate on the offended rehabilitation than someone who's obviously been there, like yourself. We're very much deep in the hole and then yeah. trying to get out of it. So, Andrew, thank you very much for giving me the time today and the opportunity. It's very much appreciated. How are we doing? Thank you, Christian. Um, thanks for inviting me on today. And, um, you know, there's a story to be told, but a message as well, as I said, um, to hopefully resonate through that. And the message is, as much as we, you know, it is old cliche that crime doesn't pay, it does pay for a period of time but inevitably it will backtrack and uh, you know it does end pretty much a couple of ways death uh, destruction misery you know prison and uh, that is the ultimate end of it you know and my story today hopefully will be able to take you along a journey that I went through and hopefully where I've come today which is a full circle and try to give back for some of the stuff I've done in my life um, be it too late in some cases, but hopefully um, enough time left to change young people's lives who think this is the path to go down. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I'd love to, you've, got, like, you've got the most insane story of the most insane highs and some lows along the way, and obviously for years you were beaten the sort of criminal system, but eventually obviously it catches up with everyone and you can't beat it forever, and it did strike you in the end. You ended up getting a considerable sentence and come around and turned your life around. But... Mm. Um, that with all the guests, it's important to go back to the start of the story and see what sculpted you and the person you are today and made you take the journeys you did. So, um, talk to me a little bit about your background, Andrew. Yeah, family. So, yeah, the texture basically that brought me into being the person I am was one. I was a good child um, growing up, young years certainly. Um, certain good morals were instilled into me uh, from my parents. Uh, a lot of this story as well. And the grain that kind of led me in certain ways was my parents. My mother, she was Jamaican and she came from a small parish in Jamaica called St Elizabeth, just off the south coast. And she travelled to England in uh, 1951. She boarded a plane to Canada and then she took a boat across to England to join her husband at the time. Um, and basically that was a journey for her at 22 years old, which would have been you know, something really brave and insane to do, coming from such a tiny little island 
and such a tiny little village as well um, to come to the United Kingdom where you were told the streets are paved with gold and it was a great world of opportunity of course you arrive and it's this smog it's cold you've got lots of racism and you're gonna have to live in solid conditions because you know it was pretty um, harsh back then you know um, to say the least to just come out of the Second World War you know mm. lots of places didn't bond it was literally a bomb site you know um, my mum came over to join her husband um, at that time um, and that unfortunately was a relationship which uh, she suffered a lot of abuse um, he used to beat her quite badly however she was a very resilient strong woman and she was determined to succeed um, one incident obviously was happened at her house where she was staying which was um, in Stanford Hill where it was one of the areas a lot of um, Orthodox Jewish landlords had actually rent properties to West Indians coming in and of course we know the saying no dogs no blacks no Irish and that was realistically what it was like back then mm -hmm. so where they were living was not a very nice place you know they was think it was they used to charge one pound a person three person people a room and that was a lot of money back then and uh, she was there one day she came home from work to discover that they'd all been evicted because the landlord had discovered two of her friends were um, opening water coconuts on the doorstep and uh, he didn't disapprove of that everyone was evicted um don't string thrown on the pavement and she soiled toiled to get herself a better life you know and she worked hard to um create a work through the pardon system partner system was like a um, bank effectively where people would collect money from you know other trusted members of the community from their wage each week they put collectively put that money together and it would result in what they called a pardon draw which would be the lump sum of the pay to one person mm. then they could effectively find themselves into the property ladder yeah i've heard about that in the asian community yeah done, it so. is yeah as i said it's something because i'm familiar with lots of communities and stuff how they work as a community bank now they have to club together because back then it would have been never impossible for a west indian coming in to get a bank account um very much so you know even though they had jobs um banks weren't really susceptible to you know mm -hmm. foreigners simple as it was um yeah so she found herself doing a pardon system before long she found herself in a position where she could get her first property that first property really was a, a, a bedrock for a lot of West Indians coming over. It was the first place a lot of people stayed. They were sent for, people saved money. They got the, 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 um, the, the train fare, the, 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 uh, the, the air fare to come over, you know, and the families were sort of built until they could step on and get their own property and deposit for their first house. Uh, in 1958, um, her relationship with her husband at the time had then completely got, you know, unbearable. She left, um, she met my father. My dad was an East End boy, bricklayer by trade. Um, he also did run paraffin. Paraffin was the oil at the time, it was the peat basket. Um, paraffin heaters, local areas. He got to know a lot of West Indians in the community. One of his friends um, wanted to open a club, um, which was in 60 Green Lanes, Harringay, in North London. Um, it was impossible for the fella to get a license. Being a West Indian, my dad agreed to step in and place himself as a director for that business. Um, they got a dance license, not an alcohol license. Yeah. <laughs> you know, alcohol was sold from beneath the counter, you know, tins of coke lace with scotch, you know. But it was the first start really for that. And that was my dad's introduction to, you know, understand West Indian people. He also, so you know, into a favorable position within yeah. the community by doing something like that as you yeah. get yourself out there, which most wouldn't. Yeah. But so how common were, um, so your dad, what was your dad's background? My well, dad's background, basically, my dad was an East End boy, um, born and bred yeah. in Oxton. Um, he had three brothers and uh, basically they also worked in the building trade. His father before him was a builder, was classified as a master builder. Mm. He actually um, couldn't serve on the front line during the war for the simple reason because he was um, relied upon you know when, when important buildings were damaged he would effectively have to be called upon to you know make good of them and build war bunkers things like that um he was a bit resentful for that he his brother he'd um, served on the front line he'd escaped from a german prison of war camp got across to uh, to belgium holland and then um He'd married a farmer's daughter, uh, Nazis tracked them down, subsequently machine gunned him down and the whole family. Um, you know, so 
that was a journey that obviously, you know, it, it, it was embedded. They were very loyal kind of British, you know, family, hardworking, believed in, you know what I mean? You know, um, um, believed in, in things, justice and fairness. That was very important and instilled into them, you know. Uh, when it, my dad and my mum met, it was good for my mum, her ambition, my dad's, you know, work, determination. They started to gradually get houses. They started to, you know, in bad conditions, they started to do them up and rent them. Um, to her mainly amongst the domestic Indian community. Did they suffer from much racism at that time? Or huge, accepted... huge amounts of racism, yeah. you know, back at that time. You've got to understand that. So that must be the, so one well, of the first generations. Sort of it mixed. was also, you know, on the flip side, because it wasn't like, it, you know, there was a lot of, um, um, you know, relationships with a black guy and a white woman. This was obviously the way around. This was an English East End border Jamaican woman, you know. So that in itself yeah, had a unusual, unique isn't? dynamic back then, you know, 1958. You're talking at the very sort of beginning. But they, you know, weathered through it and it gave them great character, you know, and it made them a very, very distinctive um, set of people because what they were able to do was they were able to call, make, make great judgment calls and people would always come to them seeking advice, uh, very wise. My mother was more the matriarch of the family. She was, you know, known as a very stern woman who could give good judgment calls and didn't take nonsense from people, you know. And um, yeah, they moved forward. I was born in 1966. Um, when I was born, obviously, Could you? I was the only boy. Yeah, well, I'll be a football fan. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I said, it was a question of, you know, I was born, my parents had worked hard. I didn't have a terrible upbringing. You know, they'd made the best they could. You know, we didn't have a huge amount, even though they had property and stuff like that. They, you know, worked bloody hard and, you know, weren't elaborate people. They were people who weren't well flash. People. Weren't flash, you know, they were just people who just, you know, you know, blended among the grain. And I went to school locally in Stoke Newington, um, and from school I went to, a lot of all the local kids went to, um, like anything, I moved from there. I started to go to school, um, then secondary school in King's Cross, which was, you know, near Barnsbury, which wasn't a fabulous area at the mm. time. And, uh, so, quickly, what sort of pupil were you at school? What were you like, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old? You... Primary school, I was great. Um, I think I started to get to about, when I started to get about 12, 13, then I started to obviously, you know, get a little bit rebellious. And then it started to sort of, you know, shift a little bit. And um, so, you know, do what kids do, you know, you kind of, you know, go and get some cigarettes, you, you know, go around, the, you know, back at the canal, you start smoking those, you know what mm. I mean? You start messing around at school, not really paying attention to lessons, become a bit, you know, you know aggravating the teachers, getting kicked out of class, occasionally bunking off, you know, so the spiral was sort of happening, you know, at that time mm. and then. Do you remember what aspirations you had at that time? Yeah. So when you were at school, what did you want to be when you were older? Do you remember what was well, the first time, dream? I think, um, like most kids, you know, I was like a, you know, North London boy, wanted to play for Arsenal, mm -hmm. as every single kid did. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. my skills and my talents didn't live up to that. So uh, that was what we You're getting to the team today. Yeah, the real. <laughs> I knew you'd get that one in. And, um, you know, so. Oh, I found myself um, drawn to all was music, you know, and music really was something which is kind of inbred in me. And um, it started to, you know, show itself more and more. Um, it was around about, I think, around about 14, the schools were going to amalgamate. Uh, Philip Magnus was going to be closed down. We were going to amalgamate with a local school called Highbury Grove. I wasn't particularly keen on that. My parents wanted to resettle me and move me to a different school. Uh, hence, they tried to, you know, move me out the area towards um, Chinkford, Edmonton, put me to school in Edmonton. That was the Tottenham, Edmonton, Tottenham area, Arsenal supporter. That wasn't working. And uh, effectively, it got to the stage I just bunked off every single day. And how that looked was basically, I was coming back to the old neighbourhood. Uh, by this time, you know, local friends were getting involved in sound systems, you know, and we started to sort of... Um, yeah, generate our time towards it. And a uh, really funny story the other day, funny enough, uh, one of them, uh, the original guys, one of my friends, who we kind of started off in the sound system stuff together at the time. He went through different names, Dr. K, but DJ Hype, Bees and more, dominantly known as Massive now. Massive fan of him, superstar. Okay, so basically Kevin, you know, we remember telling this story, it's so funny because back then we described it as a piece of sponge in one deck. Because that's what it was, you know. Techniques turned so it didn't, didn't even exist back then, you know. DJ Hot, Daddy Earl, Smiley Shabba Dad, Andrew Pritchard, mate. 
Know your history. Yes, <laughs> funny. Oh, we go back. What did you say the other day? Acid ice. One turntable and a sponge. Lot. You remember One that? One turntable and a sponge. <laughs> That's, That's it. That's yeah. the great DJ hype was. Yes. We haven't had a pair of techniques. No, they didn't exist. They didn't exist. <laughs> they didn't exist. Really good guy, yeah. And um, we basically used to go round to uh, Carl and Elle's house, which is a few you know uh, blocks away. And, um, you know, they in their own rights became very well known in the jungle scene. They created a label called Shut Up and Dance, which obviously was one of the major labels. You know, some people say it was the forefront of jungle music. And uh, but how it started was very different, you know. How it started certainly was with, um, you know, we played reggae music, we put on small events. And as Kevin reminded me, the first um, interaction was, uh, I think it was him and Carl, jumped over the back of the, um, uh, the, the timber yard. He used to sit at the back of these houses, stole an um, eight and four piece of chipboard, carried it through the flats on their heads, and then got it back to the house where he borrowed um, one of their dad's uh, jigsaws and made that first speaker box. And that was the beginning, you know? And it wasn't long before we were all putting on parties. We created a sound called Mellow Magic for two of my friends who lived on the road. And um, we started to put on our own events from a very young age, you know, 15 years old. It's insane. So that was the first time we started to actually physically become entrepreneurs. And mm. Entrepreneurs looked like, you know, we'd go into a house, you know, it'd, it'd be a squat or whatever, do it up, make a makeshift bar, you know, sell alcohol, which we get from the local off license, charge admission, a couple of quid. And it was very funny because it was almost history repeating itself because if I took that clock back and went back to the Pepperpot Club, it wouldn't have been a similar thing. So it only would have been something which happened, you know, sort of 20 years earlier. It was a really interesting fact without even knowing it. And then 20 years on from now, or less than 20 years from now, actually, 10 years from now, the same thing would repeat itself. But we'll get to that one. And, uh, yeah, so that was the beginning of it. Um, I went through that path. I love music. Uh, as music started to progress and change, I changed with it. Um, I became a rare groove DJ. That was part of, you know, what I wanted to do. The music became a very eclectic mix. What was your DJ then? The uh, Andy P. Andy P. Yeah. yeah, Andy P. Yeah, and it had a sound system. It was called the Wild Bunch, uh, not to be mistaken with the Bristol organisation. And I put on events. You know, I'd basically hire coaches and send them down to events like there was a place called Chester's in South End, the Tony Club, maybe Forest Country Club, things like that. Yep. Sell tickets, put on shows, and uh, I started. You know, I was on that path, on that road, and it was around about. Actually, it was exactly 1988. I remember I'd moved more into the actual technical side of things where I was um, hiring PA uh, systems, had some friends uh, come in the shop one day because my parents had bought an off-license at that time in the heart of Hackney, Hackney Wick, uh, Hackney Wine Corner it was called, more of a hangout for a lot of people, community centre, we might as well call it a rice centre, people would come get advice from my parents, my mum would always be cooking a pot of food, people would always get food, you know, it was really much like that. And some friends said they were having a party one night and they wanted me to do the part of the system to them. Didn't meet the DJ, I said, not a problem. I turned up and um, at the event in Bethnal Green, you know, not knowing what to expect. It was a madness, you know. It was, it was empty one minute, the next minute it was absolutely mobbed with people and everyone was shouting, I see it, and pouring with sweat and no shirts on. It was like completely insane. So that's your first thing experience of a rave? Thing. It wasn't even raped, you know, what the hell it was. That it was just yeah, insane. Was that it was just madness, you know. And what I then realised, obviously, something big was about to happen. And every week, week in, week out, people were saying to me, look, can you do the PA? Of course, because they were, you know, breaking the warehouses. Now, to at least, you know, respectable uh, PA company, they're not going to really want to touch that, you know, when they see someone's jimmying off the door to wear us. But I've been doing this, you know, for years in terms of the blues parties, you know, breaking the swaps and porn parties. So it was nothing unusual to me. So I was happy to do it, making really good money from it. And eventually, you know, on that road, it came time come and I thought it's time for me now to get involved myself. And it kind of started with people who were, lots of raids were coming here and now, so sometimes the promoters didn't really have the money to pay me, so I said, okay, we just, let's do something, well, I'll go in as part, you know what I mean, as a partner on this one, just do them like that. But then I decided at one point, it seemed a really good idea to actually, you know, put my own one on. And the first one we staged uh, was Genesis, uh, the 10th of December, 1988. 
Where did the um, name Genesis come from, Andrew? The name Genesis, that's really funny, actually. Okay, so how the Genesis brand and name came around, uh, Wayne, who was my partner in it, he liked the group Genesis with Phil Collins, and uh, we were toying for a name, and he'd said, you know, Genesis fix a really nice name, and I then thought, it, it works, but my mum was very, you know, she was a very biblical person, you know, everything she used to do, you know, we used to have a picture of him as a child growing up of Jesus, it was called a sacred heart of Jesus, hanging in the passage, you know, it was like, comedy, you'd walk past this sacred heart of Jesus, it was like, he's looking at you, you know, the eyes seem to move for some reason, you know, there's always his eye on me. And uh, it was, um, I had a Bible, Bible in every bloody room, and I picked up the Bible, I remember Genesis, and I opened it, it was like, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, that well in the beginning, Genesis chapter one, this is a sign, so he called it Genesis chapter one. And uh, went down to the local ticket shop I've been going to for years to, to get, get flyers made. I think it was called Center Point at the time, Center Point, something like that. And um, yeah, I had like, I think 500 flyers, flyers printed. We looked through the book of illustrations and saw, you know, a picture of the head of Zeus and thought, well, that'll do. You know, we stuck a Zeus head, so effectively we put, Greek God, the most powerful Greek God, Zeus, on it and called it the most biblical chapter of the Bible, Genesis, unwittingly and unknowingly. Anyway, uh, first of all, we had was uh, all get East Station, a uh, terrible warehouse, Wayne found it. Uh, there was no banisters, there was no stairs, it was, it was a complete death, another death trap, you know. But it would do, it was one of those ones. So I had the sound system, I had the lights, we went in there, we sat up during the day and snipped back there in the night, started to give out flies to everyone and made a meeting place, all get East Station, which I don't think is not there anymore. And uh, that was it, bang. Clubs emptied, the story, the usual places like that, and we were mobbed. Um, yeah, first event, police did turn up as they tend to. This time I realised Wayne was a really good um, talker and he would try to front things, so Wayne was stuck at the door. He uh, tried to talk to the police. Um, one incident happened, which was hilarious, the fire alarm went off, and uh, we had to give him a hammer, basically, to run around all the back of the warehouse, smashing off hammer, um, the alarm bells, to go back to the policeman and say to the police, like, oh, sorry, the alarm went off, I had to just go take care of it, switch it off, you know? Mm -hmm. Not, but no, he's got the hammer in the other hand, in the behind his back, you know? We are just smashing off alarm bells. And uh, that was our first event, you know, it went on. How much did you make on that first one? Not no more than a couple of grand, but it was still a lot of money, you know. It was something for us, you know, to get it through the door and to get it on. A fun way to make money. It was a fun way to do it, yeah, you know. It was something, so I was getting like maybe £500 a night to hire my sound system anyway. So I was doing sometimes two, three parties a week. So, you know, it, that was, I, was, I was getting pretty much for the, but the buzz of doing your own event made it all the difference, you know. And, um, yeah, shortly after that, of course, we had a party, that was great, but we needed another warehouse. we come unstuck, um, and then uh, we were in limbo. We looked at a few warehouses, we were driving around the streets with back alleys at night, trying to find somewhere, couldn't find anywhere. One night we drove down the back of uh, Lower Clapton Road and saw these lights on in this warehouse. So we pushed the door, saw like about four people standing up there with some sort of strobe light going on, some music going on, and it was an attempt at a warehouse party. So. We thought, bloody great warehouse, you know what I mean? So we said to the guys, look, you know, let's take this warehouse off of you, like, we're having it. So, you know, we saw this, like, the lights on in this little warehouse, and it was like, okay. So the guys sort of like, you know, uh, no, you're not, you know, they haven't said a warehouse, all precious about it. So we were stuck now, didn't have a venue, what do you do? Anyway, um, wasn't long after that, uh, Wayne said, look, I've got a friend, Keith, and uh, he found a warehouse. Obviously, he wants to be part of it. So I thought, okay, let's see the warehouse. Anyway, we went and we drove back exact bloody warehouse, what we'd seen a week before, anyway. Somehow we'd managed to get keys for it. So it was like, okay, we're on, you know. Let's bring him on as a partner and let's um, have a crack at this, anyway. We, you know, subsequently sort of like moved on what was called Leaside Road. And we set about, you know, making it our venue. So we had time to dress it properly, prepare everything. We used to do little bits and pieces, we went to, um, um, a place in um, a Silverman thing that we called in Stepney, we used to get these, these parachutes and uh, this camouflage netting and all these bits and pieces yeah. to kind of decorate the warehouse. Yeah. We used to get sawdust from this uh, mill basically, we'd put it down on the floor to absorb, you know, when people had drinks and yeah. stuff like that. I think we've only done it actually, there was lots of oil actually on the warehouse surface, so you put the sawdust to absorb the oil. And we made it one of our trademarks for our warehouses ever since that day. And uh, yeah, so we set it all up, uh, had an event, I think that was held Christmas Eve, if I remember rightly, actually another week before, maybe just before Christmas Eve, had the first event in now, 
and uh, that went quite well. You know, it was the first one we sort of broke in now and had, had things going. It was used to store tyres and we created all these bars and stuff from nice. the tyres and the DJ ramp from tyres, everything. And um, so, what about the, the drugs at the rave? Were you guys arranging or sorting the no, drugs at the rave? No, at all? no, the drugs no. are obviously essential for the rave to be successful. Yeah. Well, time. drugs, listen, anyone will be lying if the chairman said that ecstasy wasn't the most major significant part of the raves because it was, you know, um, at that time we were not into that, you know, and um, I certainly wasn't into it, you know, and I know Wayne was never into it, you know, I don't think he was really into it like that either. But um, it was a question of people who came in and it was very unorganised as well in terms of, you know, it hadn't really, you know, got its structure. These were coming in, but they weren't really at the point which, you know, devolved over those following months, you know. Yeah, when small, it became a real business. Yeah, so people were bringing in a few thousand here, a few thousand there, you know, but it wasn't a massive, massive industrial business that it became, you know. And um, yeah, we had a party there Christmas Eve, that grew again. Then we had another on their box, you know, that grew even bigger. And by the time we got to um, New Year's Eve, basically, we were becoming bigger and bigger. But one significant turning point was, yeah, I think it was in between Christmas Eve and Boxing Day, a guy turned up at the warehouse. Now, I'd known him previously, because when I used to hire the sand, I remember one particular incident I'd done. Um, I was brought uh, to meet some guys. This was Jeremy Taylor and Tintin who went on to do energy. And uh, they were trying to put on an event called In Search of Space. I think it was over in um, West London, a big uh, carpet warehouse. And uh, yeah, so I was involved to help them with that. And um, never forgot what happened basically that particular day. Uh, the police had turned up in mobs and drones because they'd invited right along the world in action. And they were doing this whole thing for the mystery tour. And uh, the police officer got wind of it, and the police turned up in there, you know, in their dozens with riot shields and everything like that to stop the event anyway. Me being me, I decided to lead a, you know, mob of people towards the police. And of course, everyone I thought was behind me, everyone wasn't behind me, all was in front of me with dogs and police. And subsequently, I took hiding from the police that night. But um, I remember Jeremy Taylor, and Jeremy distinctively, because he had a thing of a cherry blue, a cherry, um, cherry red BMW, and I've got to see <laughs> smoke coming off the wheels as soon as the uh, police arrived, you know, which is quite funny. But yeah, I remember meeting Tony um, Colson later up in their offices anyway, so this was the same guy that turned up in their warehouse, and I was like, okay, and it was like, same thing we do with other guys, like, this is a great warehouse, you know, and like, we don't have none of it. Um, there's no way he was going to, you know, to have our warehouse, we were getting established now as Genesis. So he said, look, why don't we do parties together? You know, I thought, okay, that can work. He said, he's got a great crowd coming down. He's done a little event prior to that at Greenwich. So it was like, okay, game on. So we put together an event. I think that was, that was actually Christmas Eve, that one. And uh, we, sound system, he said, he can organize it. We got um, Joey J, I think um, that was um, uh, Norman J's brother, who used to do Shake and Finger Pop, but there was a sound system before that called uh, uh, Great Tribulation. So sound system was good, um, lighting was up to scratch, the event was good, but then the next party we scheduled to do was going to be with Sunrise, and then we went from there, so we started the Genesis Sunrise um, era, so mm. to speak. And they just grew, you know, I mean they grew literally overnight. Um, I remember when we got to New Year's Eve, um, it was one of those events, it was like, wow, this is going to be the event, you know, we're going to really have it you know, down pat because people were coming, remember the first night we'd open Leafside Road, biggest track at the time was S Express, um, that was a huge track, and uh, Mark Moore and S Express brand actually turned up at Leafside Road, you know, and people were now starting to hear about the event. So when we went New Year's Eve now, it was amazing, you know, we tapped out 6,000 people and it was like huge, like wow, this is, there'd never been this party that size ever before. We had Mini Vanelli had come down, they were like the biggest, globally the biggest you know, group, you know what I mean, in the world. You know, you had lots of celebrities, Boy George was there, everyone was, came down and mixed. It was a mix of everybody, black and white, rich, poor. This place was only can be described as a modern day studio 54 yep. because people have always said to me, what was Genesis, what was so special about it? And I think it was a Studio 50 of its time. And it relevant from any venue, whatever venue you we went to, we put our brand on it, you know? And uh, yeah, we we done that. That was a great event, New Year's Eve. We thought it can't get any bigger. And of course, it was the first week of January. Who goes out first week of January? It's a dead time, everyone knows this. And um, 
we held the event there and we tapped out 8,000 people, you know, and the warehouse was huge, the parties were getting out of control, really big, and it was just going on and on and on, you know, it was seemed unstoppable. Mm, so at this point, obviously, where the parties get bigger, bigger, you're making more and more money. At a certain point, um, the criminal elements started to take a look at these parties. It's, like, when did this happen? This was pretty much at the time of tapping out of the East Side Road, yeah. so we tapped out of the East Side Road, and done ironically. It was um, it was funny because we thought we were going to be at the side road New Year's Eve, you know, because New Year's Eve had come and uh, we we're in the warehouse straightening the place up. Police officer walked in and was like, "It's a straight warehouse because we'd already been through this when we thought we had, you know, had keys. We thought we had a lease." And it was like, "Right, it's a fire hazard, you know." Coming back with a fire inspector, he came up with a fire inspector. The fire inspector was less than pleased that he'd been dragged at his, you know, Christmas party. And uh, basically just looked around the warehouse, didn't even do a proper inspection. If he did, like about half an hour before, we'd sort of put about 50, 100 black bags full of tins and threw them on the fire exit, do you know what I mean? And, I mean, it was madness. The guy just literally opened the doors, looked at the doors and just went, said, everything's free, how have I? And that was us, you know. We had a licence to print money at that point, you know. And people were getting to know about us as well because I mean, we were closing down the West End. And uh, done a huge party, um, as I said, the, you know, the week after uh, New Year's Eve. And then, sadly, <laughs> it turned out the warehouse that we thought was legitimate wasn't. Uh, Gypsy had sort of, you know, given the keys to Keith, tried and fire for a week. He was throwing tyres in there, but he owned nothing about it. So we were out on our ear. But effectively, um, because we'd grown such a big organisation so quickly, the police were terrified that, you know, you'd have 10,000 people now turn up at Leaside Road, middle of Hackney, in the middle of the night on a Saturday night. Where are you going to go? You know, it's a, it's a nightmare, logistically. So we had two police cars, one at each end of the road, giving out our flyers for the new location of the warehouse. Okay. You know, you couldn't invent it. A warehouse was just broken into, you know what I mean? It's mad. And uh, around about that time, as I said, uh, then you could see criminal eyes were on us. So it was a really good idea to, you know, move forward with, it, uh, beef up the security, you know? So uh, we beefed up the security. Um, it was actually Wayne's stepdad who worked at a club and he knew some doormen uh, a lot of those guys were connected to the football firm ICF and uh, they'd done door work though, they were pretty good at what they'd done. Others were armed robbers, others, you know, there were known faces in the area who'd done door work and they seemed suitable to be our door. And uh, they became the Genesis crew, late known as G-Force. Yeah. And um, they moved with us effectively and we started to go from event to event to event until we were actually, you know, every Saturday night was Genesis night. And, you know, we did, we literally did tip out the West End. People weren't on our going to go some of those clubs that they would go to on a Saturday. Traditionally, they were coming straight to us. Added to that, we had a, a guy who done a mobile cab firm outside the WAG, and he would um, give out our flyers in exchange, basically, to all the punters leaving the clubs, be in exchange for, you know, being able to set up, you know, his mobile cab facility outside the parties, wherever we were. So he had a gold mine going on, and we had a great thing because we didn't have to, even, we did fly still ourselves, but, we knew virtually every single punter going into the West End, every club in the West End, on a Saturday night, but leading up to that Saturday night, they were getting Genesis flyers. So our flyer distribution went from like sort of ordering 500 flyers to getting like 10, 20, 30,000 flyers. Do you know what I mean? Because we knew they were getting distributed. Do you know what I mean? So you knew we were going to get our parties filled. Everyone knew about them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it grew, it grew, it grew. We literally went from one warehouse to the other. Loads of funny things, you know, happened and... Uh, in between, there were loads of, we became great at blagging the police, you know. As I said, there were lots of funny stories we could cover. And I've had some, you know, madly hilarious ones. Wayne done some great ones. I remember one particular one, the police had turned up and he told them that um, it was a photograph, it was a, it was a film, a video shoot for George Michael. You know, and a copper had turned up, really fell for it. Even guy came back and asked for his autograph, you know, and he had a bogus guest list he'd made up basically and let the copper see it so as you could see Elton John, all his names on there. And at one stage, we had the police actually parking cars, right? And it was just like a complete made a mockery of him, you know. And uh, it was always that, it was always the black, it was one, but it was harmless, you know. We were doing this stuff and we were moving with it gradually, as you said, at this time now, it. We had lots of elements which were lurking, but our door was incredibly strong and they were actually really a powerful door. And what was amazing was, even though they were football hooligans themselves, and it was really crazy because you'd have West Ham, Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, 
all these hooligans would go. So it wasn't just West End people, it wasn't just black people, it wasn't just the pub guys, it was the extremes. So as guys that go to the blues boys, reggae, who would never go to an event like that, were now coming. It was a football hooligan mob, we went to the pub only, were now coming. And the whole of club land was coming, celebrities, you had the whole mixture of people. And their dog, do you know what I mean? It was like crazy. It must have been an incredible time. It, it must was have been the best time. It in your was incredible. Life. It was incredible. Energy and everything that was going on. You felt like you were celebrities. You didn't feel like it. You were celebrities, you know. Mm. And it was great, and we lived in the moment, which is fabulous to do. But unfortunately, at that time there, um, during the fat shot, right, there's also the rave, the legal raves, and XC was becoming a heavily politicised topic, and they were using. It was, it was yeah. some, another something that they were going to use. Well, what happened was, is basically, there was a, the, 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 the political weight was put down there. And there's a number of reasons that contributed to this. Because you understand, the breweries were the form of working class entertainment, okay? So the pubs were where the breweries made all their money. And we've got to understand, during that time, people were going to the pub for a drink, but then they were going out. They weren't staying in the pub. And when they were going to the warehouse parties, they weren't drinking beer, they weren't drinking spirits, they were drinking Lucasade, they were drinking Pepsi, they were drinking Evian water. So the breweries were taking a massive hit, both for, you know, for, 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 for sales, take-out sales, and for, you know, and for in-house sales. And government so tax purposes also. Well you've got to understand, tax. and the brewers are really well positioned politically as well. So a lot of the pressure was put on that particular scene, I too, still to this day believe, was, you know, a big part of it was down to the breweries, their influence and power in government. And, uh, of course, you know, Thatcher didn't like the idea of all these people getting together because divide and conquer, of course, is always the way of any government. And uh, you suddenly had all these different fractions of football hooligans all together, best mates on, you know, Saturday night. Obviously, they're still fighting on the, on the tourists on a Saturday afternoon, but they could come to our parties and that was it. So if you look at it in today's gang culture, because you've got to understand that, you know, the biggest problem we've got now is gang culture today, all these postcode gangs, kids killing each other, fighting each other, football hooligans, even though they must have kill each other, were not dissimilar. They were mobs of people that would fight against each other in rivalry. We used to put an end to that and prove they could actually get on in the same space at the same time, so it was possible. Now, if you look at a government, and, you know, football hooligans are one of their biggest things to play on, you know, to get votes, to get money, to say you're going to go hard on them, mm. and all the other stuff, we were target number one because of the drugs. We became target number two. So there it was, you know, it was laid up, laid up on us basically. And Margaret Thatcher, in her undivided wisdom, uh, recruited a man by the name of Ken Tappenton, who was a commander. He was in charge of a special unit called yeah. the pay, um, pay Party Unit. Yeah, I've seen a couple of and he was, yeah, and he was then lifted out, you know, with a team of 600 men to go and hand a stand on a Saturday night. Yeah, I've already spoke about um, how impressive your military organisation was. And uh, so the people of today, the promoters of today, don't realise what you had to go through to put yeah, on these things. Yeah. Or it's finding rage, cutting into them, whether legally or illegally, setting up sound systems, blagging these, yeah, putting out did. flyers. Yeah. You know, you paid a big price, and historically as well, you know, and this is what people have to understand, we've come for a lot, you know, because, and before this, going back to the first generation of West Indies when they were doing little blues parties, I mean, you went through a big price just to have your culture, you know, and, and, and relate to it by having a blues party on a Saturday night and having your traditional food and playing on traditional music. You know, there were guys that were caught with a spliff and got two years in prison back then. Do you know what I mean? And... It was not dissimilar to when we were doing parties. You know, there were guys that was caught with a bag of these, and they were doing big sentences, you know, because the government wanted to, they didn't want you to have the freedom that you could dance all night. We never knew where the parties were going to take place. So we had to be as wise and adept as them at getting the manpower out. So we worked on the principle that at any one time we could muster up to three to 400 police officers. Now, the idea of that was if we could muster 400 police officers in the first hour, we could stop a party. They hadn't made that law legislation and they weren't benefiting from it. Yeah. So they wanted to be strict and prove it's our way or no way. That's the problem. The first people get caught up in the crackdown and the ones who end up suffering the most, isn't Got it? it? So Got it. It's what it is, you know. And uh, they were our parties. We created a, our own brand. We weren't very good business people. I'll say that we were entrepreneurs, but we didn't understand about establishing brands. You know, Ministry of Sand came after us. They understood about branding. Yeah. You know, had we 
took that on board at the time and thought about it a little bit more or brought some of the good business equipment into the business, you know, we would be that brand, you know, we're yeah. getting headphones made and we're getting, you know, jackets made and you're getting record labels and you're getting everything that comes with it, all bells and whistles. Yeah, because everything that came next after. It came stuff. after, the whole merchandise concept, the whole idea of a real brand did. But what we can happily say is we were some of the first pioneers of that scene and, you know, as mad as it sounds, it was a landmark in British history and musical culture, not seen since punk rock. Maybe not even British, just worldwide. If you look at the, the yeah. dance music today, it's yeah. spread around the world. Yeah. A lot of it did come from this country. Well, look, one of the things that shocked me the most was um, you've got London British um, yeah, Modern uh, History Museum. And Genesis, our first flyer, Genesis Chapter 1, is exhibited. And I'll give you the exhibit number for that as well. That's a history museum. You know, so any way you look at it, cut it shut, it's like sort of dice it, you know, because Darren said tomorrow morning to my children, I've done something which actually made history, you know, and it's marked in history. Whether you want it to raise it, you can't erase history, it's going to stay there. And, you know, so that was a part of my life that was good. And there was stuff that came with it because you're right about the door wars and stuff like that, you know, because money was changing hands in a big way. And security firms, you know, were looking a part of that action. Our security team were a powerful team, um, and they kind of went on, you know, forward to sort of, you know, get work in other clubs. Yes, yeah, so was Colton one of the leaders of that team? Colton was one of the 12. We had 12 guys. There was, they called them 12, and we had 12 very well-known guys who were the framework of Genesis security. Colton was one of those guys, and other people that Colton knew, some of those were from the original ICF football firm. Others were just very well known people who had histories in armed robbery and you know and, and violence. Yeah, and faces, you know. Um, but I must say one thing, they held our door like no other door. Do you know what I mean? Genesis's door was bulletproof. That was the right everyone knew it. You know, you knew if you come to Genesis, don't fuck around. Do you know what I mean? That was as so simple as it paid was. Off in, in if you stars. came to Genesis you just don't fuck around. Do you know what I mean? And that was it. And it was a stamp mark, you know, and it was very respect it was a respect thing as well. Mm. But they kind of got a little bit you know, um, carried away with it and stuff, and they started to get involved with other doors. And you know, there were people to say they were doing extortion rackets and all kinds of stuff. And by giving themselves this glorious name of the G Force, the police didn't identify the G Force from Genesis. And because we've been fronting these parties, you know, and the police every week were like looking for poor Wayne, you know, he's got himself with his baseball cap and all kinds of stuff because he was going to get, get fronted. Oh, uh, they had a, a manhunt, you know. It was, it was all kind of new to them, wasn't it? This whole raid thing. So it was like security. What this is you? This is you. This and it was complete chaos, you know. Like, I'm a pretty good blagger myself, you know. Don't get me wrong. And I remember um, there was incidents where I've you know blagged in, you know, blagged warehouses, and the, like, the police have turned up with the owner of the warehouse, and I've blagged him to turn off his alarm. And I've told him, you know, that my dad's bought the warehouse off of him. The guy's convinced himself that the warehouse has been sold. You know, opportunist. I remember one particular day, it was. Funny enough, we'd, um, we went to the party that night, it was Sunrise doing the party, and um, John McHugh, somehow Tony managed to get John McHugh, who was U2 stage manager, on side with him, you know, he used to go to me with like 600 pound, you know, silk suits, he'd be pushing out speakers, like, you know, at six, seven in the morning, it was like, what the hell was he doing like that? Anyway, um, I remember one day he had office, he had a company up front, a huge staging company, and they were based on the Docklands, had another branch in Los Angeles, I think Bono bought it out completely at some stage. And uh, we, were, um, we, were to, we were going to Tony's event, so we turned up at the office, John said, come by, and he'll get us like a ticket. Anyway, it wasn't a ticket, we actually done was got his business card, laminated it, and uh, said, listen, what you do is at the door, just, you know, give them that, and that's like a VIP. So we said, great. So we, myself, Wayne, a couple of girls we had with us, went, done it, got them, anyway. We're driving back, and I planned to take a leak. So listen, I said, Wayne, just pull up here. So I jumped out of the car, walked into this alley, I started to pee anyway. I've heard someone shout me, I mean, oi! Anyway, I thought it was Wayne, just messing around. Anyway, I was carried on. The footsteps are coming closer. Oi! It's coming closer. But suddenly now, it's that, oi! Right in the back of my head. So I've turned around full face. So what the fuck do you want? Anyway, I'm looking face to face with a policeman. Right, that's it, you're Nick. So he's grabbed me, right? Wayne's seeing all this, looking from the car with these two girls in the back, right? I think, oh, God, that is a bit nicked, anyway. So he took me to the police car, thrown me in the back. So Wayne's now driven at distance behind the police car to Limehouse Police Station. I've got in Limehouse. I think, oh, for fuck's sake, right? What am I going to do? Going to a party. But I remember I've been doing warehouse parties constantly. 
some of those parties have been in lime ass. And in one instance, some of my equipment had been confiscated by the station, so I'm back and forth with them. And I'm thinking, oh, holy fuck. Anyway, so we're sitting in now, so the policeman um, looked at me and he goes, um, right, okay, so what exactly are you doing? Exactly what are you up to? So I thought, I'm going to think on my feet here. I've gone, I don't know what you're saying, what I've been up to. So I wanted to go to urinate, I said, but, you know, I, I, I was desperate because I had to get to Wembley. So we go to him before I said, we've got a show tonight. I said, you too. I said, I'm the main engineer. He looked like that, right? I've gone and said, without me, there is no show. I said, you don't understand, this is catastrophe. So they look at each other, thinking, this is geezer for real. Anyway, I've took the card out of my pocket and I've gone, look, you better phone the manager. And he's not looking at that anyway. It looks at each other. I've got there, I said, the Docklands number there, the LA number's there anyway. So he's looked. I know John's left the building now because he was sitting, he was going just after we left. So anyway, now, when they phone the number, I know it's just going to ring, right? So he's called the number. It's ringing, it's ringing, it's ringing because he's had a phone call. Right, there's no answer there, but he's heard the message machine, got it? So he knows it's bonified. Yeah. I've gone, you better call the LA number. He's gone, we can't call America on this phone. This is the police flow, taxpayers, money, all that. I goes, look, I goes, I've got his mobile. I said, give me a phone, I'll call the mobile. They go, no, tell me the number, I will call it anyway. I've peeled off Wayne's mobile number off the top of my head. So That's when people used to be able to remember numbers back in these days. Back in the day, right? So he's gone bang. Anyway, he's phoned Wayne and I've heard him go, hello, is that John? I've heard a pause on the phone because Wayne knows what kind of blaggers we are. So I've heard, uh, yes. <laughs> he's gone, oh, I've got someone there to talk to you. So he's giving me the phone. As he's giving me the phone, Wayne's pissing himself laughing at the other end. So I'm just going, I said, John, I said, this is terrible. I said, I said, I've been stopped by the police. I said, um, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, Bottom's going to go mad. I said, because this show's completely sold out. I said, there's over 70,000 tickets up. This is when we stayed there. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, so I've got, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, without me, there is no show. I'm watching the police's face get redder and redder and redder. Beads of sweat coming off him. He's thinking, what have I done? Because really, should have nicked me, right? Anyway. I've gone, what do you mean we've got to get the lawyers down? I said, um, uh, oh God, I suppose we could get them here. I said, um, sorry officer, what's your name? And he's looked at me and he's heard lawyers, he's heard you two, he's constantly getting called off. He's gone, uh, uh, uh. so he don't give me his name. I've gone, um, hold on John, um, let me just um, find out. I don't know what the charges are, how serious they are. I said, how serious are the charges? He's come like this. So the policeman now is backtracking drastically because he doesn't want his headache, right? It's going to be in his station. So I've gone, um, look, I said, John, I, I don't know. Let me ask him. I said, um, what, what's going to happen to me? He said, don't worry, it'll be all right. Don't worry, it'll be all right. So I said, John, I think it'll be all right. I said, you haven't got a contact by all the lawyers just yet. I said, let me see how this works out. Anyway, I put the phone, give the phone back to him, right? He's put the phone down. Anyway, so they're looking at me now, and it's a standoff, isn't it? I've gone, I'm really sorry for that. Like, you know, I didn't want to cause all these problems. I said, but this is, we've got a major problem. Anyway, I took me downstairs and so in my entire life, listen, I've been in the Dudley police station, right? And I've never been put in a police cell with a door left open, right? So they put me in the cell, sitting in the cell, thinking, what's going to go on next anyway? He's come creeping back down to the thing, right? The sergeant, and gone, look, said, um, you know, I think he's overreacted, he said, by, you know, arresting you so hastily and that he should have perhaps maybe just addressed you in the right way and told you not to do. He said, um, you've got to stay here, he said, for an hour or so. He said, well, we've got to obviously process certain things. He said, um, but um, he said, I'm going to ask you something. He said, a little favour. He said, my son, he said, absolutely loves you too. He said, there any possibility you could get, you know, if you can't understand anyway, get a photograph or a, or a something signed. And this, I said, after you've helped me, like, I said, I any I said, what's your son's name? I said, I've written the son's name. Then I said, like, I said, I don't know how to get this to you. You better give me your address. Right? <laughs> so the cop was giving me his address. <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you what I said. I said, as soon as I said, I said, I said, I get back. I said, I get Bono and all the guys to sign this on a new CD. Anyway, he swallowed that. So he's can't let me out. Anyway, when he let me out, Wayne's sitting outside the car, pissing himself, laughing. Got in the car, we've driven down. I think it was called Midsummer's Night during that part. It was an amazing part he had in Slough. And uh, yeah, that was just another one of those blank stories. But we became really good at blagging. Such fun stuff, wasn't it? That time, yeah, yeah, but blagging the police was never a problem. You could pretty much blag anyone, you know. And uh, that was part of the fun. And that was a part of that journey that we're has seen. It was quite harmless. But harmless to a degree, a lot of people 
you know, did take drugs. And there was a bigger dynamic to it as well. And it took me years later to really get it. In the fighting drug scene, would you say as much? This is different from bringing a cross well, hard heroin and coke, isn't it? That yeah, you know what, Christian? Fighting, right? Let me tell you this though, right? It took, it's taken me to get to this stage in rehabilitation to understand it. Two things gave birth that, you know, over that scene. One was the birth of the social dealer. Prior to that, drug dealers were holding criminals, okay? And a drug dealer sold drugs, that was it. What you had in the warehouse parties, it opened it up to middle class white kids yep. selling drugs. Because, not because they were drug dealers per se, they actually wanted to take some pills for themselves. They had a group of friends, maybe eight, nine, ten friends, all were going to buy a pill. So in their head, if they buy 50, they get a really good deal. So they're actually there, give them their drugs, and get their drugs for free. Yeah, no, I, probably, I ended up falling into that. That wasn't from you engineering creating these legal rape. This was right. never to be going to happen. It this never, is from right. drug okay. laws more so than if Exy hadn't been created. Yeah. The, when Exy got created, these things were happened because of the drug laws, not because of the legal rape. Well, look, ecstasy wasn't created overnight. Ecstasy had been knocking around since the Second World War. Yeah, since the wars, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And people don't realise that. You know, it was given to soldiers, yeah. basically, to keep a warm nose in Florence and, you know, give them a stove to fight together. But... It's something obviously it was it was almost a perfect timing of the music of the scene of the political landscape and the drug fit perfectly in the middle of it you know and as I said so that was a wonderful period of time because it united people across Britain black white it, it was indifferent there was nothing like it ever seen before or seen to this day and in many ways I wish you know I pray that something could come along that could actually, you know, bring the young people together again in a positive way, you know. Um, and if it could come without a drug being at the centre of it, that would be fabulous, mm. do you know what I mean? But yeah, so social dealers really were born from next to from the scene, warehouse party scene, I have to take responsibility for that. And many of those people who were then selling drugs decided they would make a career a living out of it, and they then became drug dealers. They moved from, from selling ecstasy to selling cocaine. So again, that has to be acceptable that that's something which has happened, yeah. you know, so... Again, I can um, corroborate with that. That's the problem. People yeah. don't realise how that small decision can lead yeah. to so such I'm a change. So I'm going to be practical and tell it as it is because if I I'll be lying. It. Yeah, and I'm going to take it on the chin. Yeah. I'm going to say straight, look, I've done it innocently at that time, but maybe what was, that opened the door to was things that at the end of the day have affected people's life because people do suffer. You know, children do suffer when their parents are on drugs. Do you know what I mean? The children aren't properly necessarily looked after in the right way they should be. You know, there's distance between the families. You know, there are people that are overdosed. They're, you know, they suffer when they should be, you know, spending money on their kids or, you know, focusing on something other, otherwise. They can lose days taking drugs. They can damage their health taking drugs. Yeah, so no, stuff can happen. So I'm not going to sit here no and, and I'm telling you this as someone who's probably responsible for importing and bringing in so many drugs, you know, and move them across the globe that you know at the end of the day I've got a lot to answer for that's the reality of it you know yeah. so are you, are you much worse than the sort of beer production companies the people who are bringing across all this beer or the Tesco in all honesty all look, in all honesty right there are there are drugs that people give to people and they're supposedly in the benefit of cure and of health you know you can take a, 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 a headache tablet you can take a pain relief tablet and it can eat out your liver do you know what I mean you're not hearing that so there's damage that is being done every day and there are drugs which are being manufactured by massive pharmaceutical companies supposedly for curing elements when there are actually herbs and plants in the rainforest which will do that with no harm to your, you yeah. but the benefit isn't to the drug company. Do you see what I mean? Benefits to drug companies. So there are evils out there. We've got to accept that. Absolutely. So I won't accept now at, my, at this stage that... Yeah, I you're can, not trying to pass the buck. I can't pass the buck. I can't turn and say to myself but I justify what I've done because everyone else was doing it. Because if we do that, we're living in anarchy. Do you, yeah, know so mean? you believe it was morally wrong you put on these raves at this time? No, it doesn't feel at like that time, to me. At that time, it but wasn't. But looking back at it now, do you yeah. think it wasn't wrong, was yeah. it? Yeah. Well, one interesting thing was on a documentary which was made, which was National Geographic, when Captain Tappan speaks, and he, as the police commander, turned and said, what were they doing? You know, his argument was, why he took out 600 policemen on a Saturday night and wasted all that taxpayers' money hunting us down when we were having innocent parties. What was the point of it? The argument was, though, that organised crime got involved. Yeah. And it had a lot bigger, you know, hand to, in the later stages than, you know, what was happening. By organised crime being involved, we had to be the centre point of that. Do you know what I mean? So, so is, is that not just a legislation issue? Because look at what happened, obviously, you say, obviously, clubs like Ministry of Sand and all these other sort of roads get put on all the time now, legally. 
and in 20 years time are all these drugs not going to be legal as well? Well listen, at that time we were just working class kids, we didn't have a chance, right, that's the reality of it. And will drugs be legal? I think some drugs should be legalised, personally, um, you know, in a simple reason, if, you know, drugs are, you know, manufactured and distributed in the right way, you know, through doctors and people are properly assessed, I don't really see certain strains of cannabis as being, you know, damaging. In fact, it's being improved with oils and, you know, stuff that's being made now to help people sleep. And you're not talking about someone's sleep, you're talking about Parkinson's disease, you're talking about all kinds of elements of people suffer with epilepsy. You're finding cures for those in a cannabis leaf, which is a pure leaf. Stronger strains are now being grown, skunk, things like that, which aren't organically grown as weed is grown. Weed yeah. is a plant which comes from the ground. You know, I can't see harm in that. So that's one, and now it's starting to see the green. You'll leave in five years, it will be legalized, okay? In this country? In this country, yeah. Five to ten years, I'd say, you know. Well, that's the window. For well, I think we'll find a situation, number one, first of all, for medical use, it will be legalised because it's already on that road. All the test experiments are proving that, you know, products are coming out of there and they're life changing medicines. You know, we're looking at the benefit of hemp, you know, hemp's an amazing plant, you know, most fabrics, things, creams are all being made from that, you know, and people actually get involved in the industry, making lots of money from it, legitimately that, and employing people, you know. And will recreational use of cannabis be legal at some point? Why not? If they implement tax onto it, as they do with cigarettes, I'll find it less, a lot less harmful than the salt peter and things are put in cigarettes than would have been originally put into cannabis. So we're at a turning point, I think, with the drugs issue. Um, cocaine, well, what goes into cocaine? You know, well, a lot of stuff goes into cocaine. Everything from cement to, uh, to acid, do you know what I mean, to battery fluid. So there's a lot of chemicals going in now, you know, to get that end result of Colombian flake or whatever product you're going to get. But everything has um, elements, which I think could be good, because a cocoa plant is a wonderful plant. So you have to look at it like that. If there's a way of people processing drugs in a way that's not too harmful to human beings, but more benefit, and beneficial in terms of taxes that can you know have things like hospitals built like you know make us have a better life better education for our kids i'm saying that's the way we should look at it opposed and to more people. importantly rather than the taxes that they can make it's more of the cost to people from the, the, the legislation that's there at the moment i think like lives that get destroyed that really don't need to be um well look how i see it is like this double-edged sword so you know um with <laughs> We're led by governments for the past 100 years, eight years of that, we have a conservative government, right? Now, they position people in these places with PhDs and these are the right people. They don't put people who have got social backgrounds who understand these things and lived experience. And that's the you find in the prison system, you find in all the systems that really matter, make, to, which change people's lives and do get the effective, you know, um, people, the people who are the hardest done by, you know, so they have not got a corner, do you see what I mean? So we're just basically under the book constantly. So when a voter, you know, has a, 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 an MP that, you know, says we're going to go hard on drugs because drugs are destroying lives and drugs are creating this and that and the other, whether they are or they aren't, it's a vote, okay? Yeah. And they know where their vote is lies. So they would never give up, but they'd never turn around and say, well, it's actually all a lie and it's pretty harmless, okay? They have to go along that road because they've already, you know, they've already laid out their case, you know? So to me, my personal view, I think at one stage, and I hope it's in my lifetime, the drugs will be looked, re looked at and we'll really break them the bullshit and turn and say, okay, what is really harmful and what isn't really harmful? What's not really that harmful? Let's look at legalizing that and make that a benefit to people. And if we are getting money from doing it, there are all people who will be addicted to certain drugs. Let's spend that money back in clinics and education for our kids. Not stigmatize it, let our kids know about it, know the pitfalls of it, you know? And then you'll see real change, you know? And unfortunately, we're a society that we want to punish you know, and you see the state of our prisons, you know, <laughs> and any society in any country in the world you go to, you can tell the people by going to their prison and you'll see because that's where the people are. Yeah, there's not much rehabilitation in the prisons. They don't country. believe in rehabilitation, you know, they believe in punishment and warehousing people for votes, yeah. you know, which is a very, very sad state of affairs, you know. So nice. that's just my personal, you know, sort no, of I'm not saying we that. get to what you're trying to do yeah. down the line in terms yeah. of the AP Foundation. But, um, so at a certain point, 
when the rave stuff got to a sort of a height and it created a sort of breaking point and um, at some point did you say that you end up having to start to get involved in the drug sort of element of it like yeah. I said they're essential and so eventually yeah. well, you get yeah. to the thing with that basically it was when the rave sort of starts to come to the end in terms of where I was my involvement in them um, I was there so I had this great skill set I could put on parties and events I wasn't moving on as a club um, side of things which now super clubs are starting to open and now licenses are being cured. I have a bad history because of the license and obviously we live warehouse buys. And you know, I wasn't terribly connected in the legitimate business world, but I was connected by this time in the criminal world. And it was a matter of time, it was inevitable, you know. Um, I knew people who were at the heart of manufacture. And you know, it made complete sense at that time. I knew everyone who was supplying drugs at the party, I knew Everyone now who'd moved on to supplying drugs in the club land, I knew most of the securities that controlled the doors of the venues. So, you know, it was a question of now I had access to buy drugs or give, get given drugs at an incredibly good rate and I had ways of distributing them. So it was something I decided I would merge into. And of course I did. At the time there were different tablets. There was one particular tablet which just sort of raised their head called the Dove. And that was... a new tablet, the design of it, the look of it, the cleanness of it, it just ticked all the boxes, you know. And um, I started to get involved in the distribution of that, and obviously it started to grow and grow and grow and grow. I was very close to an organisation that were getting a lot of those in, and uh, subsequently I became a main distributor of those pills. And I used my contacts basically to open those doors, and that's when, obviously, I'd stepped away from being a promoter into dealing with Class A drugs. And Class A drugs is a huge step but you look at it very mellow because it's ecstasy mm. and everyone's having fun, everyone's enjoying themselves, but you've got to realise that's got a brand as a Class A drug. Yeah, um, I know it does, but it's, 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 I find it difficult to categorise it with heroin and cocaine. I've never met ecstasy users using it daily. Do you know what I have? What, the people that use it daily? Yeah, I've had, yeah, I've had. Not so much now, obviously, but I used to know people used to take ecstasy every single bloody day yeah. during that period of 1988, 1989, you know. Um, I can't say I never any deaths at that time, only one, okay. Um, a very good friend, you know, wasn't diagnosed with a death of ecstasy. They said he had a swollen heart, yeah. but I believe it was, it was a, a deduction of ecstasy that brought that to happen, brought that back. Probably but, a predisposed medical condition, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, case? yeah, so whatever it was anyway, as I said, you know, there weren't any, you had more chance of falling off a horse and dying than you take an ecstasy tablet and dying, let's put it like that, you know. And um, yeah, so that was where it was with ecstasy. Um, my next, obviously, step of the journey after getting heavily involved in it, tranched in that and started to move into circles of organised crime because that's the way it was, it was shaping up. Um, an incident sort of was floating around me, basically. Um, there was, I was around different people, groups of people and uh, they were climbing a ladder, let's put it like that, in terms of um, influence in criminal circles, criminal, you know, um, organisations. And, you know, I found myself in a position where I keep getting, you know, doors kicked off, looking at connections with murders and mad things like that. So it, it seems to be coming down really, really badly, you know. And um, I decided one day it was a really good time to leave. So I decided, um, you know, to sort of, um, exit this country. So, um, a nice little nest egg at that point. Sorry, you saved a nice little bit of money at that point. There, I'd made money, not a huge amount because we spent so much money, but I had enough, which was full, very fortunate for me that I could go wherever I wanted to go and not have to worry for a good period of time. And, um, I, you know, my journey took me to Paris. I sat down there for a month, stayed at a very really nice hotel, almost as a tourist, you know. I used to go down to the Cafe de Paris every day and shop and do the stuff that a tourist would do for going into exploring Paris. And uh, I then exited from there, went to Miami, managed to get a, a, a book, a red book that I could fly with. And um, I went into the States. I spent several months in Miami, which again was more of a holiday. I had people in Miami, though. And then I made the next leg of my journey, which was to my mother's spiritual home, which is Jamaica. And uh, when I arrived in Jamaica, I found myself actually somewhere that, even though I'd been there many times as a child, it was my spiritual home and I connected straight away. And that was where I, you know, sort of, you know, I, I, I stayed there. I laid down there, I felt comfortable there. And <clears throat> that was my journey, how that started. I was around family who were very politically connected. 
Um, they were very, very, you know, um, respected people. I had a lot of extended family as well, not just blood family. And my mother had been a big influence on my father in helping bring people here. Not everyone that was brought here, who came here back in the 50s and the 60s, um, were people who wanted to, you know, work for London Transport or work for things. There were people that wanted to aspire to be criminal entrepreneurs, you know, and then people did put on the shabine parties and they did sell weed and they did do other stuff. And, um, you know, some of those people returned to Jamaica in the 70s when they made money. They'd obviously moved from stuff they were doing here in England and they'd realised at that time Jamaica was a good spot because of where it was logistically placed. Um, it was a lot of turmoil going in Jamaica back then as well, remember that. Um, you know, Michael Mandy, he took state power, so it was more or less a lot of the politics was happening now. And um, there was a huge drug market, you know, and he managed to, you know, find that market from Jamaica into the States, mainly Miami. They found a market to come back here. Um, and they found other routes, you know, from Colombia, you know, Colombia straight into Miami. And, you know, used that Caribbean circle and effectively created the Eastern Caribbean cartel, which merged the islands. And um, when I was in Jamaica, um, I had a, it, was, it was a journey, a path I was going through. And um, people had here wanted to, you know, get involved in um, smuggling, you know, cannabis stand because the profits in it were huge. And I was, you know, really well positioned to make that happen. And uh, yeah, I was brought into um, a powerful circle. Um, I was then, I found myself being introduced to people who had a lot of influence, who could get stuff done, you know, who were politically collected as what they called dons. And um, I had people down here who were running what we'd call organised crime groups. And I could facilitate stuff so I could effectively. You were the key. <clears throat> I was the key, yeah. I was the door, I was what they called a link, you know. And uh, yeah, that was what happened, as I said, you know, so we'd, um, they'd come down, they'd spend some time with me, we'd sit down and just didn't work out what they had in England, what transport they had, and we'd work out, okay, fine, we could get out of the island in whatever means method was needed, and obviously then we could, uh, you know, um, get what other products was needed, and yeah. it took to vast volumes. And so was this working with a specific organisation in Jamaica, would it be working with just set shower, or was it working no, with, no, with different, different people, different, different individuals, people. Just it was unorganised it, it, Everyone refers to, you. okay, so you've got people who are politically connected, um, and do, who run constituencies, but you refer to their people as dons. And the most too popular dons and their gangs associated with them usually matches lane, which is referred to as the Spanglers, and Tivoli Gardens, which is known as a shower posse. Yeah. You know, these are two very well known gangs, but there are loads of gangs, you know, and there are loads of constituencies and there are loads of these are garrisons. <clears throat> and a uh, person that I was introduced to, and uh, I'd done a lot of work with, was a guy called Black and Dooch. And Black had controlled a place called, he was out of Jonestown, and um, that bordered into Jungle, uh, Maxwell Avenue. And he, you know, his associates was Black Rose's uh, crew, which is a very popular crew. And um, yeah, so I'd done a lot of work with Black Heart. It was PMP who were in power at the time, so that was a political party which ran things. He was connected to the PMP party and he had access to the Wolf, the docks, the airports. We had it, you know. And we basically used to ship a shitload of, you know, cannabis back to this country and other places, mm. you know, and it was funny because... I thought it was very good. Well, it was so. a really funny experience because it was like a, the Gunja plantation, we used to call it the Gunja factory. And uh, I remember, I forget the first time we used to go to what we call the Gunja factory. So I think it was deep bush, it had been St. Elizabeth, which is my mother's home parish in St. Elizabeth on the south coast of the island. But down in Nigril, which is right up, you know, on the, on the west right. coast, and then you had you had other places which produced marijuana. But generally speaking, these were the two best places. You get really, really high, good high grade, which would come down from Nigril because you had the longest day of sun. So you know, there was the sun would set and uh, you know it rise there. So you got a great, you got a rainfall usually in the afternoon as well. So great hybrids of weed could be grown now, and they use what. Rat, which is bat fertilizer, bat shit, and that would be basically used as a fertilizer in tires, and <clears throat> the plants would be grown, and obviously, so they wouldn't contaminate each other. And this was a very really high strain, which was called hybrid, and that hybrid was high grade, rather, high grade was brought into the first three month crop, which you have now for. Um, for um for skunk you know but prior to that it used to be called sensimina which is seedless basically but that was a nine month growth so as long as the army came with the police they'd take out your crop you're in trouble but away from that you know i never forget the um uh, the factory we used to call it so we'd go and we set up factory 
um, out in the bush. So how that would look is, you know, you'd have an unbeaten dirt track basically, you'd take a four-wheel drive in there, you'd be literally out in the middle of nowhere, and when you come, the farmers who are local would obviously know that you were going to be there to buy products because you wouldn't plant them yourself, you know, plantations are too easily burnt. Burn. So each independent farmer is independent farmer, they work under a certain farmer, so the seeds are consistent, and um, they would then arrive with what they call the crocus bags full of their weed, you know, and uh, that would come with big stems. Then we'd have a negotiator who would then weigh the weed, buy the weed, check the weed, and then we'd be buying. So we'd buy, like, say we had some, I don't know, say send five times, so, you know, Jeez. approximately. And so you, you'd be buying this off sort of 10 different little farmers? Yeah, but so what they do is they collectively do it. So you'd have one farmer, he'd maybe go to 10 farmers or five farmers, and he might drag me on a ton. You'd have another farmer, he would then drag together five farmers. Maybe he's got his own harvest, do you know what I mean? And you get like a ton now. Then you get different, you know, catchments. But generally speaking, you get a similar weed, but it's very important that you don't want too many grades. And how, how did you send it back, obviously, at then times there? Was that obviously well, containers? Well, what we used to do was, yeah, all kinds of various ways, but the actual ganja farm was quite funny. When we started off there, and I saw it, it was serious, because they'd buy the weed, and then the weed has to go through a process, and so the process was we'd have, um, out in the bush, obviously, we used to have uh, sticks up, tarpaulins over the top, tarpaulins on the, sh the floor, which is tarpaulin sheets, and women sitting in a circle with these very fine knives. All the weed goes in and they call manicure in it. They take remove from the sticks and seeds and throw the buds into a single tarpaulin. And then outside you've got the guys who are working on a jack. So the jack basically has got two big pieces of rail track. They're on the ground. You've got a large 10 ton press which has been welded into that. They have hydraulic, literally yeah. hand press. Different kind of um, pressing plates are then made according to what the shipment's going to be. If it's going to be in tins, they're circular. If it's going to be in blocks, they're square. Yeah. Whatever you need, you used to be able well to make them. And then they're thrown into a into a little um, blue bag. That's then weighed into whatever the weight's going to be. They're thrown in. They're pressed the life out of because it's compressed. Unlike skunk, which yeah. is loose buds yeah. in pillars, these are this is compressed stuff. And uh, that's done. It's then wrapped, you know, furiously in the um, cellophane and um, brown bait and brown tape. Then we put on our um, our a dog repellent on it, which we used to make ourselves. And then we load them in an ambulance or on the bottom of a sugar cane lorry or some sort of vehicle, which is highly unlikely to be stopped driving back in to one of the ports where mm. you know drugs are going to be sent from. So. That was how it started off, and people would be out there cooking, big pot would be going on, because, you know, I, there was a saying, you know, always have a pot ready, because people would travel for, for miles for the food, and that was important, you used to get the best people working for you in that environment, and after a few, you know, times of that environment, I thought, let's modernise it, because I used to do the warehouse parties, I'd become accustomed to these camouflage nettings and all this army stuff. I was sent down and we sent down for all the camouflage netting to replace the tarpaulin and we sent these smokeless cookers so there wasn't log fire so the helicopters couldn't see it and we were, we were bringing it into this almost military organisation so yeah. our camps were becoming quite sophisticated really you know with stuff I was sending from down here and uh, you know very very productive as well funny enough you know so we could really big orders really quickly and uh, that was how it was, and we had access to the airports, we had access to the wharfs, you know what I mean? And so we pretty much, you know, no job too big, no job too small, we've done it all, do you know what I mean? So and must have been made serious money at them times. Huge so. amounts of money, you know, and then we had to get the money down here and get it back, so it was like, how do you get this bloody money back? So we used to have, um, we used to actually have someone down here who used to, lots of people that used to buy high performance cars, used to buy, buy big industrial lorries, where people down here wanted to buy performance cars and buy lorries. But that was only so much money you could get back that way. So what we then started to do was actually open the lorries up. So we used to open up where the, um, where the side bits are, where the doors go underneath, and then lift that and then pack that with money, basically pull out the whole dash, pack that with money, do you know what I mean? And then not only get the money for the vehicle from the person who's receiving it, but all the money, the hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds, that are packed into lorries as well. And of course you've got to think, when the money's down there now, you've got to get that you know, uh, brought back because obviously that's the money that goes in Jamaica. Our friends in Jamaica, you know, great you want foreign currency because you get even more money from the black market do you know what I mean and then it became another stint because they would sell awesome. that money back in to people who wanted to buy legitimate cars down from England and from America and where else so that was the whole cycle in itself you know yeah. and uh, yeah we you know and that was what we've done we've done every form method uh, you could possibly think of 
of smuggling that was, you know, that was off, it was off the chart, you know. It would be a question of, there would always be something, you know, and it was ingenious because the genius of people, when they really are determined to make something happen, they will make it happen, you know. So, yeah, that was what we've done, and we've done that successfully for a really long period of time. Living the high life of seeing Jamaica these times? Yeah, because you're more, pretty much almost untouchable, because you're safe from police, authorities, you know, pretty covered in every angle possible, um, and you're having a great bloody life, and you're living in the sunshine, happy days, you know. Um, what can I say? Um, things happen though that change your mindset, you know, and uh, two things happened that kind of started to make me become aware of the business I was involved in because by ecstasy I got a realisation what it was doing to people. This business also had its realisations. Um, I remember I'd um, been back and forth to Britain and an incident happened. I got a phone call. I said, what's happened? I said, Black Black has been murdered. I thought, okay, right, you know, and um, it turned out that basically Blacker had been uh, meeting with someone, a woman on Don called Willie Hugger in uh, Maxwell Avenue. Um, the car rolled up down the lane. There was a white Corolla, um, which police, uh, play clothes police traditionally use. It rolled up. The guys expected it to be, it to be police. Um, Blacker had a licensed firearm on him. He produced a firearm to say it's licensed firearm. Three guys got out of the car with AK 47s open fire and killing them all. And um, it was a bad incident because that incident was how tapped in the level it was because they'd killed three dons. Now, you couldn't drive a vehicle into that constituency without it driving out looking like a cheese grater with bullets. Mm. So all the guns and the heavy artillery that was in that constituency were moved out. They would be moved out because you all had contact with police and everyone had police on their payroll. So a call would have been made to say, there's a raid going on, so get all the guns out of the constituency, which they've done. But effectively, who made that call to them was on their payroll, that someone, a higher authority in police force or government, a very high ranking police or a politician, to send a message down the line that a raid were going on. And then all the guns would have been taken out of the constituency, allowing that to happen. Mm. So, you know, there were different rumours I was told what happened. What you never found out the truth. Well, you know, a, one um, theory that was knocking about, one of the guys murdered a guy called Willie Huggett who ran Black Roses. Um, there'd been an incident supposedly where the club in Cotswold had been robbed in the States and um, he was supposedly been responsible for it, mm. the robbery. And uh, there were people that were, you know, subsequently um, lost their life as a result of that, you know, and severely sent messages, Colombian neckties, which who doesn't know a club in the next ties where someone cuts your throat and pulls your tongue through your Adam's apple. So these are very powerful signals. And um, yeah, it was, uh, that was one of, the, one, of the, one of the theories what happened, you know, they yeah. were getting their payback. And um, unfortunately, people were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So had you got involved in the cocaine business at this point? At that point, no, um, to be honest you. At that point, we were exclusively um, involved in the importation of um, herbal cannabis, marijuana, yeah. because the money in it was so great. So if I can give you an idea of the kind of profit margins that were there. So from source, and you um, used to pay £50 pounds sterling a pound weight, okay, for high-grade weed, right? Um, you're talking about, by the time that's, you know, processed, you know, we've done, we've done, we've cleaned up, we've got it with preparation, we paid, Customs, you know, uh, to to trip to, to leave the island or whatever facility we use the company to get it through. We're probably looking at about maybe in a region of worse where 150 pounds a pound. Okay, landed in this country back then it was 2600 pounds a pound. Okay, yeah. that's about two. That's five grand a key approximately, but we do it in pound weights. Yeah. So every thousand pounds, okay, of weed that you're landing here, you're getting 2.6 million pounds for. Okay. Even wholesaled at the most ridiculous rate, you're going to get £2 million or £1.8 okay? So if you're doing five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds of wheat, you're talking being on scale with some of the biggest cocaine distributors already in this country. Yes. I mean? So it made complete logical sense just to be exclusively 
um, you know, dealt with the importation of high grade marijuana, which of course, if properly sealed and contained, will last for 18 months. So if you've done one big shipment, successful shipment per year, you were happy to, you know, have that put in different places, distribute for that, and you were good because the profit margins were so, you know, were, yeah, were, 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 were so vast, yeah. But like anything, you know, um, when you're in that game, products are products, you know, irrelevant what they are, it's the game of logistics. So whether you're importing um, record decks or, I don't know, picture frames, if you're importing drugs, you know, whether it be cannabis or cocaine, it's ecstasy, it's just another product with a different price range, you know what I mean? However, it does carry a different sentence. It does carry a different heat as well, yeah. because the police and the authorities are far more interested in class A drugs opposed they are to class B or class C drugs. So, yeah, that was my journey, and you know. Just so, so after Black had, uh, had been murdered, did this, was this a wake up call? You well, decided to sort it, of swerve it, everything it for was, a little bit? No, or? it was just one wake up call, because Black wasn't the only person who had lost their life, you know. I'd maybe come across maybe eight or nine. Was, was Blacker the one, sorry to interrupt you, Andrew, uh, was Blacker the one who was sort of your mentor in the, the smoking world? Or yeah, I had, actually mentioned him by name. I had a mentor, I had a mentor, uh, I'm not going to mention, yep. and stuff. They, they they passed away now. But he was my real mentor, you know, he kind of guided me. He was a member of the extended family, you know, and he introduced me to Blacker. Yep. He was retired at that time. Oh, as so well, Blacker was right. the younger one who had sort of passed his contacts to him. So most mentor. people, a lot of people within the, within the game, who were significant players, some of them still significant players today, were really under his wing, you know? Um, yeah, and he kind of took me under his wing, he described me as his nephew, he brought me in properly, do you know what I mean? So I could pretty much go anywhere, and it wasn't just Jamaica, it was most of the islands and most parts of South America, I could go to and I could get what I sort of wanted, because his journey was funny, because as I said, he started bringing vast amounts into this country, into the States, he worked through Colombia as well, and in the 70s then, that the mid eight late 70s, when the cocaine production in Colombia was becoming, you know, insane, and they were no longer interested in bringing Colombian gold, he got rid of all these boats and stuff, because he had amazing roots, and he then stepped away from, you know, um, dealing with Colombia, but his youngers, were, I would describe it as youngers, his apprentices, they obviously, you know, led on those contacts and the cartels that were now existing, who were becoming incredibly powerful, especially sending cocaine to mainstream America. And they made a lot of money doing that, you know? And uh, yeah, so that was my route into the business properly at that level, you know? And um, that was it. And unfortunately, you know, when you're still on that journey, you quest money, you quest excitement, you know, you, you, you want everything, you don't know when to stop, you just keep going. And, you know, lots of people around me were killed and murdered, loads. You know, it became a really thing which was scary. It became an everyday occurrence and it meant nothing to me. And that's what's frightening when that becomes a normality, you know. And that was it. So that was where that took me at that time in my life, you know. Um, and, yeah, it was a question then for the next, you know, sort of journey. I came back here. Um, actually, other things happened. I reverted back to music at one stage. I really wanted to sort of, you know, um, get back into the industry, which I love so much. I got involved in concerts, legitimate concerts. Um, I wanted to put on a festival. There was an opportunity we had, and uh, we managed to bring back Reggae Sunsplash, which was a huge, you know, urban festival as a child, or a young man doing reggae sound system. The ultimate mecca, the prize was this biggest thing where Bob Marley had appeared on, where Steve Wonder had appeared on stage, we had all these wonderful things. and. Again, for extended family, the door was open to me to capture that and license that and bring it back to England, you know, and had an amazing show at Victoria Park in 1999, 50,000 people. Mm. And it was a step towards legitimacy, you know? Yes. And um, again, it seems like saying road tells people with good intentions and sometimes, what they say, bad luck is worse than obia, old Jamaican saying. Sometimes you just are so close, yet so far, and an incident happened, uh, not during the event, after the event, not even connected to the event, that made me really go back to Jamaica again. Mm.